That was a drawn out open right there. That was. I had to get. I had to get the phone. <laughs> Man, every day feels the same. We're like two weeks, three weeks, two and a half weeks into this quarantine, maybe three. It's like Groundhog Day. I don't know. We're we're too long. Yeah, I saw the Groundhog yeah. meme, and I was like, that is how I feel right now. It, it's although it I have been going into work, but okay, so you get I'm to leave essential. the house. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the meme that uh, was it a Baskin Robbins the mascot? He was like oh, at yeah, work we're just in the, the bathroom. bathroom taking a selfie. He's like, "Somebody <laughs> please tell me how I'm essential." There are some uh, some things that are open right now. I'm like, "Is this essential?" Yeah, I've seen a few I'm things. Not real too. sure. I've questioned, but it, it's crazy. Although one of the craziest things is that I did get gas for a dollar forty two a gallon yesterday, yeah. and I'm like, I'm not sure what the correlation here is, but I'll take it. I could explain why gas prices are cheap, but that's not for this podcast. Um, irrelevant. So welcome everyone to the Aged Out Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Fantini, and with me as always is... Evan Worrell. And today, as we mentioned a second ago, we are still in the midst of this quarantine. Um, WGI obviously was canceled, as we talked about in the last episode. DCI, DCI. has been canceled since our last episode. Yep. And before we continue, and before I forget which I have done before, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube, like the video, leave a comment if you'd like, uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook to never miss an update about new episodes of the podcast. Hit us up on patreon.com at patreon.com slash aged out podcast. If you'd like to give any kind of financial contribution uh, to the podcast, we'd appreciate it. But as I've said in the past, it is not required in any way. We're not gating any content or time delaying the podcast releases for people that do pay or don't. It's just there if you want to help support us. Uh, and so now just that's out of the way. get some cash here and there just so we can <laughs> ramp up production value. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So without further ado, we will, I'm sure, discuss the DCI tour being canceled at some point. But we have a guest today who is a good friend of Evan and mine, and I will let Evan take over from here and introduce him, and then we'll uh, see where this thing takes us. Yeah, we got another guest from the West Coast, although he's not always lived on the West Coast, which we'll get into a little bit. Uh, but this guy marched indoor with me for a year. Um, actually, under some revelation, I figured we almost probably could have potentially marched outdoor together, but passed it in a line. Uh, actually marched with Mike and I both 2012 Rhythm mm-hmm. X. Uh, but welcoming on with us, Mr. Paul Winterhalter. What's up, dude? Yo, yo, yo. What's up, guys? Not much. I saw when you uh, Skyped in at first on the video, it was still nice, bright, and sunny out there on the West Coast, and it's dark and about to storm here. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been like this the past few days, actually. We, we had some rain, um, so I'm happy that it's kind of gone away now as i look out my window yeah it is it's been a nice day today lucky with the weather are you what in california are you in yeah uh orange <laughs> county it's uh tustin tustin california irvine's kind of like the big city next to me oh yeah right on yeah so i'm gonna show my geographical ignorance is that socal uh yeah you know what's funny is like when i first moved out here so we lived in san diego for a little while my wife and i and my sister's down in San Diego still with her husband. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, San Diego, border of Mexico. It's like, oh, yeah, this is Southern California. And then I, you know, eventually we moved to Orange County and people were like, oh, yeah, you're, you're in SoCal, right? And, okay, yeah. And then I go to a show in Fresno, which is up, you know, kind of what I would think is NorCal, kind of near San Francisco. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to that SoCal show, right? And I'm like – all right, so where the hell is SoCal start and stop? Like, <laughs> so, yes, technically I am in what they would call SoCal. Of like, you know, I'm kind of parallel, a little closer to the water from like Chino Hills, Arcadia, um, pretty close by geographically, all those dudes. Um, I'm where, so I, where I work at Yamaha, the head offices are in Buena Park. Um, that's about 15, 20 minutes up the freeway from where I'm at. Nice. It's kind of funny because I guess, and I don't know, I, I mean, I know the ge- geography of California, but I think someone told me one time you can drive like from the top to the bottom or bottom to the top, whichever way, like 
12 or 13 hours and still be in the state. So I guess you could drive from the border like four hours and still be in like the bottom third or something like that. Of the state. Yeah. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So for that show, actually, it was a uh, work like like an MEA, actually. Um, I had to go up to San Jose and, you know, flights ended up my flight ended up being canceled for whatever reason. It was rain or uh, stormy or whatever. Um, so I had to rent a car. And from San Jose to Orange County was eight hours. <laughs> oh my gosh. dude when i came out to see you well i didn't come out to just see you evan but yeah I, when i ended up getting that's what i that, thought <laughs> yeah well <laughs> when i ended up seeing you that was another uh, trip for work I, I i think i drove eight hours across like four states <laughs> yeah exactly especially if you didn't you start in like georgia or tennessee or something yeah i yeah flew into nashville ended up driving to um U, ut and then from UT drove to UK. That's what I saw you. And then that same night from UK, I drove to Indy. And yeah. all each of those drives were like three, four hour stints. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Well, Lexington is like pretty centrally located to a bunch of major cities, actually. But yeah, I could drive from here in Kentucky through Tennessee and through Georgia and get to Florida in eight hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a little weird. Definitely not what I'm used to, you know, especially coming from the East Coast and and from Dartmouth and all that. It's, you know, definitely more acclimated to the the East Coast style of driving and being able to get around places more easily (laughs) without the crazy traffic. Sweet. Well, since uh, since you bring up the East Coast, I guess we'll kind of we'll backtrack and we'll get into some more of the uh, Yamaha stuff and what you're getting into these days and California life and all that. Um, So as you stated, uh, grew up. In the Massachusetts area, New England, mm-hmm. uh, went to high school, middle school at Dartmouth. Is it Dartmouth Middle School? Is that, is that what it's called? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It was okay. uh, Dar- Dartmouth Middle School that feeds into. So it's one. It's re- a little different than most um, school systems, I guess. Uh, so it's one middle school that feeds into one high school in Dartmouth. Um, and the, you know, the school probably has the high school probably has like less than 4000 kids. So it's it's a decent sized school. Um, the town, I don't even know, maybe 35,000 people in the city of Dartmouth, um, town of Dartmouth, whatever it is. Um, so one middle school, and then there's like four or five elementary schools. Um, and since I've been there, they changed it to one elementary school. Oh, wow. Kind of a big, yeah, kind of a bigger one. Um, I still think there's like two or three that operate, but yeah, they've kind of consolidated the, the system. But nevertheless, yeah, one Dartmouth Middle School feeds into one Dartmouth High School. That's pretty wild. I mean, yeah, here one middle school. That's a big middle school for a thirty thousand. I mean, thirty thousand is not a huge town, but that's pretty much what Richmond is, where I live. But there's three middle schools, uh, right? So I guess too, just like since we're on that topic, why don't you just start give us a brief synopsis of like your introduction to music, and then like getting into middle school, and then you obviously had a pretty unique instruction from the beginning that yeah. we'll get a little more detail in uh so yeah take it away real quick yeah so i guess started from from the very beginning um i was the first one in my family to really pursue anything musically so when i got into it i was really the first one um which is always kind of cool to think about and kind of where i got to go you know eventually trailblazer yeah right I was a big sports kid too growing up. So my, my oldest brother um, was actually the high school basketball coach at, at Dartmouth, their assistant basketball coach. Um, also taught at UMass uh, or coached at UMass Dartmouth basketball. So my whole family were sports oriented. I, I always played football, basketball, baseball growing up, as I'm sure a lot of us did. Um, but yeah, fourth grade, um, I got into the music program at my elementary school at the time was DeMello. I think I went to DeMello. And then basically right from there fourth grade i was in it with mr unks <laughs> as we called him mr unks um and i hated it i threw my I, I had one of those bell kits you know and uh i remember throwing it down the hallway wanting to quit every single day and it, <laughs> it, it, yeah <laughs> it was my mom that was was the one that told me you're not quitting you're gonna see this through. It was probably because they just spent like 400 bucks on this bell kit. <laughs> she didn't. That's want to go good to waste. mom, though. Good she job, mom. dude. Seriously, thank you, mom. Um, but you know, didn't let me quit. So, uh, you know, fourth, fifth grade, uh, elementary school. You know, then went into high, uh, middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth. 
stayed with it all through those years. And um, in the middle school scene in Dartmouth, again, it was still with Tom. He was the only percussion uh, teacher, really, for the entire district. Um, all the elementary schools and then, of course, the middle school and the high school. We didn't do much in, in the middle school. We did, obviously, uh, the spring uh, concerts and, and winter concerts. Um, we did some parades around town, so we got used to kind of putting the drums on and, um, you know, marching around in the parade scene. Um, and then that kind of just led into high school. And Tom, Tom's a really smart man. He he knew from a really early age, especially in his program, what you were, what he wanted you to do in, in high school, right? So he saw you had skills in a certain area. Um, in middle school, he would start to kind of recruit you, and he would kind of be like, um, "Hey, we've got this WGI show." He wouldn't say WGI. I mean, we didn't know what it was. Hey, we've got this show at the high school. You should come by and check it out. Yeah, it's so cool, you know. And and I remember going in like fifth or sixth grade or whatever it was to. The, like it was the Nesba Home Show, which is the local circuit in, in New England, um, the Dartmouth Home Show for, for indoor. And I was just like, oh, my God, like, what is this thing? You know, it's just like all of us have our first experience with the marching arts. It's like that was mine. Um, and, you know, that, that kind of hooked me right there and, it, you know, stayed with the music through middle school. And then right when I got into high school, my freshman year, I was thrown on the baseline. Right. <laughs> and, um <laughs> I think one of the the things that, you know, looking back and when I knew that that program was really special is obviously I was blown away when I saw the first show in like fifth or sixth grade, whatever it was. But my first day in band camp, just being thrown into it, I was like, OK, this is this is a little more than all my other friends are doing. So I kind of I kind of realized then that the Dartmouth program was something pretty special. And then obviously the, the history that is there um, since Tom started in 98. Um, or even early before 98 in the early nineties, before he started when he started first, um, you know, we, we learned all that history when we were there and, and you, you kind of just had this feeling. It was like, all right, I, I can't quit now. I can't, I can't let this up. I'm, I'm a, I'm a part of this history. I'm a part of this lineage. So I want to keep it going. Um, and then, yeah, you know, from there, it's like, once you basically start in the high school, it's like, you're, you're in there all four years, you know, it's, it's very rare to see some kid come in and then kind of quit halfway through in his sophomore junior year. It's pretty much once you're in there from the beginning, you go all the way through four years. I think that's, um, uh, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, oh yeah. From a cultural Just because standpoint. obviously I'm sure, yeah, the culture and just like, not, not only from him, like pushing you guys and I'm sure you obviously rehearsed a lot, but the mm. way that he got you guys to buy in and inspired you guys. Cause I think that kids being inspired is the way that they stay in it without getting burnt out. Um, when they have these goals, when they have these like expectations or like things that they're chasing after. Uh, mm. but when they're doing it with a, a large group of friends, it's, it's a special thing. And just for everyone to, uh, obviously, yes, ta uh, Paul is talking about Tom Onkst being his middle school <laughs> like percussion instructor, which Sorry is a, a pretty unique clear. situation. Uh, yeah. Before we uh, move on, Mr. Onkst, Tom, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have to ask, and I've asked a few other people that I've known, like Alex Olivier that I marched with 2010. Did you guys realize as you were going through, like you probably realized in high school, by the time you got to high school, how like big of a deal your instructor was? in like the grand scheme of the activity did you guys have any idea in middle school that you were getting like some of the best education you possibly could yeah you know that's a really good question i don't think i've ever been asked that um i want to say no we didn't know that um it, but we we quickly learned it you know through the years like i was saying in high school um you know it, it's as I'm kind of just thinking back how to answer this question, one of the, the something that popped into my mind, something that's pretty funny actually, is every year for our final exam with Tom in, in like the music class, right? Uh, part of our final exam, we would get bonus points if we went in because we, everyone, so let me back up. Part of our final exam, everyone would go in and do a one on one with Tom. Um, and obviously he's an intimidating guy with his whole history and drum corps and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. But just as like your teacher, he's just a little more intimidating than your average teacher. You know, we'll just put it, put it there. Um, but one of the things that he would do is for extra credit, when you went in for your one-on-one, -on -one, basically your final exam in music, he, he would give you extra credit if you could, if you could list all of the years the cadets won the drum trophy. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, and obviously all of us are like in the auditorium prepping for our one-on-one, like, all right, what are the years? And you're writing them down. And it was kind of like that, but you know, you, it's just so <laughs> wild to think back at that as a kid in high school, like, obviously we all watched the drum cores in high school. We all watched the lot videos. Like we knew who Tom was, but I think we were just so like, we were so zoned in on who Tom was. And like, we just were listing out all these years. Like it's nothing like, you know, I, I can't rattle them off now, but boom, 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 boom. All these years, the cadets won the drum trophy. And it's just like, it was just a thing. I don't think we ever had like a barometer to measure it to, right? Because we were still just in high school. But when you think back on that, that's such a wild thing. Part of my extra credit for my class is list all the years I won the drum trophy at the cadets, right? And there's like a bajillion years. That's awesome. <laughs> so I'm about to look it up, actually, is, and if my phone will let me, which is funny. Yeah. I'm going to see if I can Google it. Uh, when did he start at cadets? I don't even remember. It's been a while. Uh, His first year. Was he there in 87? Yeah, I think he, he marched, marched in the I think 80s, he aged, right? Yeah, I think he aged out in like the 80s. I think his first year as caption head would have been the year, obviously, that Hannum left. I think it was like 92 or 3 or something like that. He See, they, so won, they won in 87. They won in 90. Uh, and then they won in 2001, 2002, 2003, 2005. And then, Five. of course, 2013. But. Yeah, that one. Yeah, when I was in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, it was just. But so I guess what I'm trying to say is like it's for us as students of his. It was just it was just a thing, right? It was like oh, it's listed out all these years. But I guess if we had some sort of barometer or some sort of measure to be like, this isn't really normal, right? If we could if we could have taken ourselves out of that situation, like we would have realized that what we were a part of was something kind of crazy being, being taught by this hall of famer. Um, and we all learned that after, of course, we, we know the education that we had was, you know, something special. The experience that we had was incredible. Um, and none try to try to hope that none of us take it for granted or take it for granted. But, but yeah, certainly it was, I think while you're in it, it was kind of tough to, to know, to answer your question, I guess. So you had mentioned that Tom would kind of like pick up on skill sets that you guys have. Um, did you like start taking private lessons with him in at middle school and then into high school and him realize you had skill sets towards like, oh, this kid is really interested in marimba and be a great marimba player. And this kid would be uh, a really good quad player. And also he's tall, which most quad players seem to be. <laughs> um, tall and, tall and what lanky, sort of, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so one of the, as I recall, one of the prerequisites to be in the drum line with Tom in the high school was, uh, we did have to take private lessons. The, the lessons weren't with him though. They were actually with a gentleman named, uh, Neil Sylvia. I don't know if that rings a bell for you guys, but Neil yes. used to, yeah, Neil used to judge DCI, uh, WGI. He was hot on the scene. Um, probably, I think he stopped judging full time, probably like five or six years ago now. Now um, he is like the CEO of Vic Firth, right? No. Uh, that's Neil that's, Larrabee. Yeah. That, that oh, that's Neil Larrabee. Larrabee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrong Neil. 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 No, but it's funny. They always they always used to get um, mixed up like that. But yeah, Neil, so Neil Sylvia um, actually works at the Symphony Shop, which is the local music store in Dartmouth. Um, and Neil is still a great friend of mine. Still still just, he's such a solid dude um, in, in the music industry um, and has always been a great guy to me. But yeah, he that was the prerequisite to be in the drum line was to take lessons with Neil at the Symphony Shop. Um, so we, you know, once a, once or twice a week, can't forget, can't remember what it was, I would go in and take a lesson with Neil. And as far as basically choosing or, you know, um, dep- picking the instrument that you would play in the ensemble at Dartmouth uh, for Tom, like I said, he, he really has a, has a knack for sort of fitting the instrument to the student, I would say. And, and even, you know, he, he does have the, I don't know if I would call it a luxury or a, a burden at this point or <laughs> the responsibility um, from fourth grade with these students to be able to develop them through middle school into the high school, I think it's a really special and unique opportunity. Um, so like I was saying, you know, he would, he, he sort of almost like tailors a mini curriculum to these kids thinking, Hey, this is, you know, gonna, he's going to be a great tenor player or, 
you know, he's going to be a great snare player or whatever it was, marimba player. Um, so he, yeah, so he sort of tailors that, I would say, to the student. And then, uh, like, for me, I started on the bass drum um, because he wanted to get me in the line, and he he probably already had upperclassmen that had proved themselves and, and maybe auditioned to be in snare or tenor. So I started on the bass um, in my freshman year, and then he moved me to tenors my sophomore junior year. And then for my senior year, I, I kind of wanted to play snare. And as like the section leader of the drum line, they kind of historically were always on snare. So I, you know, got to move over and, and play snare. Um, but certainly there, there's um, no set path for any student. I think of a good friend of mine, Ian Mursky, who was in the ensemble as I taught. Um, he ended up being in the QB. He was you know, a, a quad line at cadets. Um, for two years and then ended up marching devs for a year or two on their tenor line he started on marimba at dartmouth so he was in the front ensemble playing marimba um kid was a killer player on marimba too for like freshman sophomore and junior year i want to say something like that and then he ended up he was like i want to play tenors and tom was like okay and i remember giving him lessons and because i was teaching the ensemble at that time and I, i was um you know, I gave him lessons and cause he wanted to just switch and start playing tenor. So, so I mean, that's a perfect example of a, a kid being like, Hey Tom, you know, I want to, or Hey, Mr. Runks, <laughs> I, I want to explore this opportunity. And, you know, it, Tom sort of, you know, making that happen. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that, I think that a lot of people, and I'm not going to knock this in any way, but a lot of people get caught up in the idea of, high school percussionists being like well-rounded musicians which in and of itself is a very vague term especially when you're thinking the world of percussion when there's like literally thousands of instruments that you could play whether it's like latin america afro like you're i mean who knows um anything you can beat on but i think a lot of people get caught up in like oh well like these programs like a dartmouth or chino hills they just must like only play like this kid only learned how to play quads which Mm -hmm. is probably not true at all but at the same time even if like that was true just for instance um if a kid is happy with the experience that he's getting in an ensemble like making friends getting good at a a craft and a skill set learning how to work hard and make himself better and like achieve these goals like what more do you want like how many what's the percentage of the kids from dartmouth that go on to be music head majors in college. It's probably about like every other high school. It's probably very, yeah. very, very small. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. Yeah. I no, mean, that's a hundred percent. That's a hundred percent true. And it's, it's funny because I have had this conversation with a few people before and, um, you know, Dartmouth is notorious for having a great percussion ensemble. Um, and even in the marching band, it's like, okay, you know, the, the wind ensembles are great. They're, they're obviously going to be getting better through the years and, and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's the idea of a well-rounded percussionist. I mean, myself, certainly I had the opportunity and experience to be put on marimba or vibraphones or whatever it may be through the winter and spring seasons for the concerts. So I think that's the other side of it that people might not see is that, you know, they're a world-class percussion ensemble competing at the highest level, but they're also doing a spring concert. They're also doing a pops concert. They also have a jazz band, right? They have all these other facets that other high schools have, um, you know, that people might not think about or see. Uh, So the kid that's playing snare as a section leader for Dartmouth in the lot at WGI, you know, is getting ready to do a pops concert, you know, in, in, in March or whatever it is. And, you know, on Marimba, he could be playing, you know, there, so I want to just say he does do a very good job at, you know, trying to create a well-rounded percussionist you know i think but, that word you use there is the best word opportunity creating opportunity for the kids mm-hmm, to that's do what i was going to avenue out. the avenue that they want to do like this is available to you if you want to do all the things but yeah if you also just want to do this thing all right bring it on yeah yeah yeah, yeah, I think that's I, the way it should be. And, and yeah, we had Taha Ahmed on here, and he kind of said the same thing. Being in the Texas band world, so would it be fair to say that, like, as Evan just put it, I think he just put it perfectly. He took the words right out of my mouth, almost. Just of if you if you have a kid, if Tom has a kid that's like all they care about. Take me for example. When I was going through high school, I I looked at like the marching arts as my sport, like my football, my baseball. I wanted to play snare drum. 
Like I, I did do what I had to do in concert band, but if I could have not been in concert band and still been in the drum line and done all that, I would have. Would mm-hmm. and I'm not. I don't know what Dartmouth's policies are about. Like if a kid can just be in the indoor and outdoor drum lines or not. But um, if he has a kid that was like is like me, like I was, that just just wants to play snare drum, does he just does he try to force other stuff on them beyond giving them the opportunity if they wanted to try it? Like say I was like, oh, you know, cool. I'm open to percussion ensemble in the winter. I'm open to this marimba part for this concert or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think it's just like any other educator at any school. I think it's their obligation as a teacher to make sure that they're covering the bases for, you know, all of their curriculum and what they need to do. So whatever their curriculum entails, say for argue, say creating a well-rounded percussionist. OK, what does that mean? Giving them the opportunity to explore multiple uh, instruments, right, and, and and giving them the facility to learn on those other instruments. I think Tom does a really good job at that. I don't think he forces anything, um, but I think just you know shifting gears from an educator to a coach, which I think Tom does brilliantly. Um, you know, I think as a coach, when you show him something that you're really good at, he's gonna he's gonna drill down on that and get the best out of you in that avenue. Just like a shooting coach in basketball, when you're when your free throws are so hot and you go to the shooting coach, they're going to work on skills to develop your shooting. Just like, you know, Tom for the marching arts. When he saw me as a tenor player excel and, and really start to show interest and ask questions beyond just the music that he was writing. Hey, what was up with that thing you guys did over the summer? I saw the, I saw the In the Lot video. That's when he's in the back of his mind. Wow this kid really w- wants to, to dive into this. I'm going to expose him to, to this, right? I'm going to get him excited about different things. And, and so I, I think it's kind of just more like that. I think when, I think when he toes the line between coach and educator, I think that's when, you know, we're, that's when you start to really kind of get inside the mindset of the, the program at Dartmouth. And, and, you know, it's not just this group that you're seeing thrown down in the lot in April and WGI. It's, there's so many other things going on just like any other program, but mm-hmm. you know, with, with Tom, it's like just all the things we just talked about, you know, for those reasons, I think that's why it's, it's so different, right? It's, it's been on a pedestal for so long. Yeah. The program that is mm-hmm. funny yeah, story. I, I don't know if I told this on this podcast before this is like complete tangent, but if you were talking about Mike, if you could be in one program, but not the other, um, I actually had heard this funny story from my instructor in high school, and I may not be regurgitating it very accurately, but it was something along the lines of uh, back when PASIC was a big thing for college drum lines like UNT uh, and all those Moorhead, UK, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. They would compete in PASIC for the college competition. That a requirement at UNT was that in order to be in the PASIC line, you also had to be in the fall marching band line, which Mm -hmm. was, I'm sure, very much similar to most college band experiences in the fact that it was very just blah or laissez-faire, whatever you want to call it. Um, But I heard a story about this guy, and as soon as PASIC was over, because that PASIC's what, November, -November, Mm mid-November? But the football season can go on pretty long after that especially bowl games blah 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 so this guy in the snare line he was done he's like i don't want to be a marching band anymore basics done i did what i wanted to do but he wanted to basically get kicked out of the fall marching band was i guess the only way so he like walked out on like a rehearsal field one day just with his snare drum but no carrier and as soon as they like tap off to do the first rep he just like drops his drum and is like kicking it across the field like oh my like, god kicked out of the ensemble jeez yeah because uh, he did what he wanted already <laughs> he did what he wanted <laughs> but yeah, that yeah. just kind of reminded me of that story uh, yeah no he so <laughs> what, yeah tom i mean the, the thing about you know being in like the indoor and then not doing the fall band it's not really a thing i mean it's yeah. You gotta kind of do all of it. <laughs> sure. I don't know what other. I guess the best analogy would be like, um, I, I guess it's not. A, I don't even know if it's an analogy, but in in some college marching programs, like you said, like to be in to be in one of the ensembles, you got to be in all of them, kind of thing. But team player. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of 
And, you know, he looks at it as, like, development for the winter program, right? So the kids that are doing the fall band, it's the same drum line that's going to be in, in the winter, and it's kind of just that pro- progression. It's, it's just, it's all, it's, it's all a part of it. It's all, it's all one program. I mean, that, that, all that stuff speaks for itself. I mean, I made a couple of notes here. In the past 13 years of WGI Scholastic World, there have been two states represent champions, Dartmouth from Massachusetts and everybody else is from California. So it was either Dartmouth that won three years or everybody else from California won. So, I mean, that's, I think yeah. that speaks pretty, pretty highly. And then I look back since 1998 from its like inception, um, only four times have they ever placed out of the top three. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty impressive. It's, it's very impressive. Yeah. And, I know, um, you know, just, just from my experience, we, we took it so seriously too. Like I talked about my first day in, in band camp as a freshman, I remember, um, I had a schedule conflict with one of the days in the band camp is pr- it's probably pretty stock for every other high school in America too. It's like two weeks in August before you go back to school in September, you know, it's like nine to nine, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then whatever, you know what I mean? Like for two weeks. Um, but like I was saying earlier, I was the first one in my family to kind of be in the music scene and, and kind of go through marching band in high school. Like all my, my, all my other siblings were kind of in sports. So it kind of hit my family pretty fast. Like, Oh damn, this, this is a pretty serious program, right? Like drum has got to be there 30 minutes early, you know, got to can't be late and all this sort of stuff. And it was like, all right, like this is not just a commitment for me. This is a commitment for my parents too. Like they got to drive me to this practice and, and get me there. Um, but one, one of the things just talking about, you kind of tapped this memory of mine, Evan, of, of just how well and all the accolades that the, the, the program has had through the years is, you know, just, just how serious they take it. I remember our rehearsal schedule was like, Tuesdays six to nine, Wednesdays after school till five, Thursdays six to nine, and that was just for indoor. So if there was a show, we would have rehearsal before the show no matter what. Tom's biggest thing was we're gonna have a rehearsal. If there's a show, we're gonna rehearse before it. We gotta get the hands moving, we gotta get the body moving. So if there was a show on the weekend, we would even rehearse before the show. And then you're talking, okay, so we gotta drive to the show, do it load up we know we all know how that goes and then you're home at like nine gotta unload the truck you're not home till like 10 and then sundays if there wasn't a show we'd be in there on sunday rehearsing too but it's like we just loved it you know like like all of us that went through this stuff like we just it just it was just a part of us and sure there were the kids that ended up burning out after you know after high school it's like they don't want to go on anymore but i was like i was like you guys i was like yeah let's you know let's keep let's keep this going so I think that is the what we were talking about before with like, okay, Tom saw that I was passionate about it. So he threw this drum core stuff in front of my eyes and I was hooked again. I was like, all right, let's keep going. And I, that's, that kind of bled me into the DCI scene. That's how kind of I got into that. So just sweet. Well, I mean, that's like being so serious. It's like, yeah, this just is, this is what I want to do. I think that's a great segue to kind of transition from like high school. I mean, just to recap, I mean, obviously, you guys rehearsed a lot. I think there's there's no secret sauce. Like nobody's taking like the Space Jam MJ secret juice <laughs> from the locker room and like chugging it down and just being great at drums and having successful programs. Like you guys rehearsed a lot. Like that is, it makes sense. It's no brainer. Like you're not just yeah. gonna come out one day a week and all of a sudden be good. Like you take private lessons. You all rehearse a ton. I mean, sacrifices are made in order to to get a certain goal and a certain level of uh, uh, achievement. But yeah, and obviously that translates really well into the drum corps scene, um, which was Tom's influence on you a reason that the cadets were so attractive uh was that the first group you tried out for was that the first place you went yeah so actually one of my high school instructors was this dude mike mike um moore michael moore his everyone calls him stan so he marched in the cadets in the quad line um for four years um early 2000s right yeah early 2000s yeah oh three uh oh two three four and five he aged out in oh five which is obviously like cadets oh five is like the most iconic year Mm -hmm. um so and he was he was 
Yeah, dude, one of my favorites too, hands down. Um, and he was Not one me. of my instructors in high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who is your favorite? Favorite cadets? Oh God. Um, I really liked the 2000 show. Um, yeah. Yeah. I really liked the 93 show, 92 to tame the perilous guys. I have a lot of them, but <laughs> the zone was really good, but it's not my favorite. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. They anyway, you just can... played at all of the notes that year in 05. All of the notes. That's like all the only them. way to put it. Yeah. Every single one of them. Um, but so this dude, Stan, uh, he, he was, uh, he was my instructor in high school and he was the dude that really pushed me. Even when I was a freshman and I wanted to quit again, I, he was like, no man, like, come on, see this through. Um, you know, he, he was really that coach for me that got me through it. And so I think it was probably like sophomore, junior year. I really started to get into the, um, like the lot videos, like we all did and, and started watching a lot of the DCI stuff and, and just like being surrounded by that. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked. And with Stan having March of cadets all those years, I think that was the core that I was, I really had the blinders on for and just focused on them. Um, and, and just kind of consumed everything I could cadets. And there was another guy, Cam Siegel who marched, um, Oh seven and Oh eight. Um, he taught at the high school. He, he was a senior when I was a freshman. So he was a big influence for me too. Um, he was a killer player, killer marcher. And I remember just going to see him when I was like a sophomore, when he marched at the cadets and I was like, yeah, this is, this is the core man. Um, and it was funny too, because when I marched my first year at the cadets was 2010, Tom wasn't even affiliated with the core anymore. (laughs) Well, I was going to ask you, and I guess this is the perfect time to ask because I marched for Tom in 2010. At yeah, Blue Stars. Blue Stars. did he yeah. try to get you to come no um, really yeah that's the thing like i don't remember i don't have any memory of tom being like hey man like why don't you not go to the cadets and come to blue stars and i think it was kind of like the perfect the perfect scenario because i had like i had been with tom for so many years already and you talk about time spent over the summer we all know how that is it's mm-hmm. it's 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 brutal it can be brutal um and i think when you think about it it's like i had been with the dude close to every single day of my life since fourth grade and <laughs> and you know for better or worse i ended up teaching for him which i think later on helped me a lot just being being able to read the the scene and, and just kind of teach in his program i really understood his playbook so to speak but yeah he never pulled me to come march blue stars i i think he knew that my heart was set on being at the cadets um and yeah it was it was kind of just like that like he never he never pulled me to go and it was great i i you know i wouldn't change my experience for anything um having having had the opportunity to march on to colin was a huge influence still a great mentor still a great man to this day um mm, love the dude colin um, mm. colin <laughs> and i have mixed feelings about colin <laughs> <laughs> Colin's the reason that you and I never marched together, Paul. Yeah, uh, I was gonna me. touch on that. Not <laughs> not because of Colin, but I just—it's just so crazy how many different ways this, like our all of our histories and all of our paths could have crossed. But um, yeah, because if I had been did. in cadets in 2008, yeah, right. I probably would have just stayed there, which I technically did make cadets in 2008. Tom gave me a contract. Colin <laughs> took it away. Took it away. Uh, <laughs> God damn it, Colin. <laughs> Which is the reason I have Tom's number in my phone today. <laughs> yeah. I don't even have he Tom's number me, anymore. He, I don't think he I ever called had me to Tom's apologize because uh, Tom gave me a contract in December and he wasn't there at the January camp and Colin cut me for a UMass kid. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Stock. <laughs> that would have been for the summer of 2008. Who did he cut you for, Casimiro? No, uh, you know, wait. Uh, it would have been. It's like a dark. It's like a dark-headed kid that stood on the right inside of the line. I don't know, but yeah. Oh, I forget. Yeah, Tom was right. like, "Yeah, man, you're in." He's like, "We gave a contract, signed it, turned it in." Came Colin, back to camp. Colin, no, Colin's out. like, "No, you're out." I was like, uh, <laughs> hey, I was like so, "Is this normal? What is going on? Is this how drum corps works?" <laughs> is this? Yeah, dude. I actually have a really funny story now that you mention it. So, Colin, Tom, I love both of those dudes so much. I have a lot of respect. <laughs> I still work for with both of them on a professional level now as Yamaha artists. But so, really funny story. Tom, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you really got to understand his nuances and, and to teach in his program. 
it's kind of like a like a Bill Belichick kind of thing. Like he's he's running the pace, he's setting the bar, right? You got to kind of dial back and and fall under the radar and learn how to teach within his system. So obviously, Colin is a leader in his own right. When Colin was on board in 07 with the core, um, Tom was still the caption head. And Tom told me this story. You know, Colin would go out, tech the tech the drum line, and Tom would be up in the box. Well, Colin would go out, and the the session started started to kind of get too long and with tom's rehearsal if you know anything about it fantini you probably remember it's like all right reset add a set keep oh it man going, keep it going don't even turn the med off just keep going i still have uh, nightmares again. i yeah. have nightmares about reset add a set to this day yeah, dude it's just it's his process and that i think that you know is obviously why he's the man he is but it's just it's how he does it you know it it's works. reset add a set keep it going yeah and i it's, use it's it high energy teach. it's yeah it, it just works. It's it's a it just works. So, you know, knowing all that, Colin was on the field. Tom was up in the box. Colin would go out, and the session started to kind of get too long. Tom wanted to reset at a set, and Colin was still kind of talking. So it got to a point, and as Tom tells the story, it started to get to a point where Tom would see Colin walking out to give feedback, and Tom would get on the mic and say, "Start the mat." <laughs> <laughs> So Colin couldn't get his his his, uh, his words in, but <laughs> no bad. That's blood, really right? funny. Tom, Tom just needed to keep the the ensemble moving, but sometimes you just need to beat. Don't mess with my mojo. Down. Just let them get right. reps. Yeah, yeah. There's a time and a place for both. Information is also a time. I and a still place have. For reps. I still have the cadets audition packet here around my house somewhere. Like I remember because I went in and I was like to my individual with Tom. And I played, I want to say I played the drum feature from 05, like all that like same hand flam jar. Yeah, yeah. And he, he just ate it up. He loved it. He's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of had a, I kind of like, I was smoothing the room and stuff like, because I was like, oh yeah, like my high school instructors like went to Moorhead with Eric Ward, who was like, the yeah. man at cadets for years and yeah. years. Oh, I love dude. Eric, and I was like, "Yeah, I know Eric." And I'm like, so <laughs> I was, I was definitely name dropping like a son of a gun. But you know what? Hey, you gotta do, do what you gotta, gotta do, do, man. Dude, you, I gotta gotta do. you gotta stick out somehow. <laughs> yeah, but dude, it's so funny. Like, we were talking about how all that stuff works out. Is like, if Colin didn't cut you, you wouldn't have gone to Crown. And then it's like, oh, nine is one of my most memorable years. And I remember talking to you when we marched X, like. I was like, dude, oh nine, oh my god, and like Evan, like you were the dude. Like when I was marching, like looking at, or before I marched, like looking at live videos, like I knew who you were. It was kind of like that, like, and and it's you being so at Crown, funny. it is, man. It's a, it's a small world, but you being at Crown in oh nine, I was like, dude, that was the line that I idolized. I was like, shit, like. So then when we were hanging in, at X in my first year, whatever, twelve. I, I told you, I finally built up the courage to tell you, and you were like, oh, yeah, I got all those tapes on my phone. I was like, what? And I just remember, like, <laughs> driving to lunch one day on a lunch break, and you just popped in. You, like, played those those judges' tapes, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> Dude, I love going back and listening to tapes. Judges' tapes are rip, no longer. Th- no, I'm just yeah, kidding. Right. But, yeah. Not the same. Are, Definitely not the same. <laughs> those are so They don't hit the same to. way anymore. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a pretty good track record though you had cadets 2010 2011 mm-hmm. one and 11 angels of yep. demon which is a great show then you hit crown 2012 2013 which we'll talk yep. about maybe a little bit more in a second so one in 13 and then rhythm x 2012 2013 one in 13 and yeah, then you so won like two gold medals in high school <laughs> yeah so you like <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty like every decorated other year. gold medalist. <laughs> yeah. What was your motivation, I guess, after your two summers at Cadets and just winning a world championship to be like, oh, I'm going to go check out Crown in this scene? Yeah, it's so funny, man. And kind of like some of the stuff that you sent me before we got on this call, I was jotting some notes down and just jogging my memory a little bit. And it is funny. It's definitely something that comes up when I talk to other drum corps people like, oh, what years you march? Oh, Cadets 10, 11, Crown 12, 13. And like, wait, 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 so you left cadets after you won 11? I'm like, yeah. And, um, dude, for me, uh, the summer of 2011 was just a tough summer. <laughs> it was freaking hard, man. And and I know we all march on core. We all know what, you know, that level of work is. But 11 for me was just not fun. Um, and I'll be honest, like, 
I love those dudes I marched with, like all of those guys. I still keep in contact with a handful of them. Um, I, in fact, I even my old C partner, Ian Woodica, I work with him now at Yamaha. So we're obviously super close still. But after we won that championship in 11, I was just like, man, this I don't think this is for me. And and I just it kind of obviously we all go through that like, OK, I did. I did two years. I did a year. Like I've I've got two years left, especially with the expiration date on your marching ability. Like what else is there? You know, what else is out there? And at that time in, um, 11, I was already kind of looking at doing uh, WGI independent. And I was like, yeah, you know, rhythm X would be like a pipe dream for me, but you know, let's see what else, what else is out there. In 11, I was super lucky to be taught by a bunch of good dudes. Johnny Trujillo was one of them. James Sparling was one of them. Um, but one of the other dudes, Dean Hickman. And Dean, as I'll, I'll, you know, Mike, Evan, we know who Dean is. Um, but Dean, for me, was the dude that was like the Blue Devils quad drummer. Again, going back to being a kid watching a lot of videos, like I knew who Dean was and Dean didn't know who I was kind of thing. And when he came to Cadets in 11, it was super, uh, super random, first of all, but super fortunate for me. He really took me under his wing and I learned a lot from him. And one of the things I kind of picked up was like, you know, this Rhythm X thing could be a possibility. It could be a reality for me. And the more I started to talk with Dean and started to kind of learn from him, he was like, hey, you know, after that summer in 11, first, it being a very difficult drum corps to be with that year despite the win he was like hey i'm going to crown you know i'm kind of gonna go teach over there like would you consider marching there it's like you know what i think this is actually a really perfect time for me to to switch gears and that's kind of just how it happened um i kind of followed dean there um and then fortunately enough dean uh afforded me the ability to come out and do the max too that same year so it was kind of a, a few a culmination of a few things i would say right to, to why i left cadets um I guess. Yeah. To, yeah to I think a lot of people, I, th I don't think that that's necessarily uh, an uncommon train of thought. Like I know we had talked about, uh, Mike and I had done a previous podcast with Ryan Ellis, who had yep. gone to Spirit, and then he'd gone to Blue Coats, and then after the Tilt Year, I, I think it was the Tilt Year, went to Blue Devils, and we're like, hey, you left Blue Coats, and like, went to Devs, and he was like, I just, I really wanted to expand the variety of instruction that I got by going to a different core and like yeah. really maybe enhance my ability as a teacher one day. Um, so I don't think that that's necessarily an uncommon trait. Like you had two summers of cadets, like you learned that pedagogy and what they do there. And yeah, even though I'm sure Crown is probably a little bit similar in some of the aspects, it's like, oh, it's new people, it's new faces, it's a new group. So, I mean, I, I get that. I was going to, even though I didn't march my age out i was gonna go to a different core for my age out than crown um, yeah but just to get some new experiences so i, I think that that's a pretty I, well not necessarily an uncommon thing these days for people to kind of like move around yeah and it's it's funny you say that too because one of the things i was thinking about is even okay so the two years at cadets and then i i obviously ended up leaving and going to crown you know, my age out year, I even had the same dilemma. I was like, you know, I did crown in 12 and, and for all that it was, it was a great, great core, uh, tough year percussion wise. Um, also a hard show. Very, yeah. Yeah. Super difficult show. Um, tough year to March. Um, and then percussion wise is obviously just, just tough. Um, but again, I went through that dilemma of like, okay, what else is out there? Like I, you know, Rhythm X was a pipe dream for me. Even even DCI was a pipe dream, but like I'm doing it. So what else can I do now? I was like, you know, I think I want to go do Blue Devils. And I think honestly, a lot of us probably go through that. Like, oh damn, I want to go March Devs, but like never do it, right? Yeah. But from yeah, so for me, I was like, I, I definitely went through that. And I I was even talking to those dudes like after the summer of uh, 2012, like Chris Drummer and and those um, uh, what was the other Nick Garcy? Um, yeah, Nick Garcy. Yeah, he would have uh, aged out. Scott, in 12. he was the yeah, center Scott, snare. Scott. Nick yeah. RC was the center in snare 12. in 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was so, Amador still there? No, Amador. No. Amador was... taught Lucas in 12. Okay. Um, who's the other? In 13 was um um, he's a killer drum set player. He uh, was a tenor dude. Um, oh my god, why can't I think of his name? But anyway, <laughs> there's a. 
it'll come to me. Um, There's a few few guys that were there I was talking to, and I was like, yeah, you know, I definitely want to come out and try it. And, you know, like, obviously it didn't end up happening. But I think a big reason why it didn't happen is because of the people at Crown. And that's really what I fell in love with. And, Evan, I don't know if you feel the same way, but that whole team, um, you know, of, like, Jim and Nancy and Mo and, and Kevin – um, just like, just really good people. I've always been really good people to me. Um, and especially having that experience with Hannum and, and the percussion staff there, I, I think, you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And, and one of the dudes that like, I'm still closest to, to this day is Zach, Zach Schlicker is just a dude that like really propelled me into the, my professional career, you know, kind of got me the gig to teach at crown after I aged out. Um, you know, help me get some other professional gigs, teaching and, and even playing and stuff. Um, not that I ended up pursuing that a whole lot, but he, he was Zach. a dude. Yeah. Just a dude. I love like so much to this day. I mean, dude was at my wedding. You know what I mean? Like I just, every time I'm in India, I, I, I see him, we hang out, but yeah, it's just, uh, I guess in so many words, just the people at crown is really why I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I stayed and the reason why I stayed. And then you won another gold medal. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, not, the, it was an odd year. Purple pants. In the, yeah, in the purple. Yeah, purple pants. So when they, speaking of purple, when they, like, did you see that uniform in person for the first time or was it a picture or what? <laughs> Dude, so spring training 2013, we're at G Web. For those of you that don't know, listening, it, Gardner Webb University. And Best move so, inside in all of yeah. DCI. Yeah, hands down. Um, better than better than Marion for sure. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so G Web were there. Move in thirteen. They bring the uniform out and they're like, "All right, we need like three people to come, you know, to the admin building and and put the uniform on because we're in full ensemble." And uh, I forget who was up in the box, but they called my name. I went out. So. I go put this thing on and I'm like, Oh my God, are you serious? Not only <laughs> is this going to be the outfit for the season, but I'm going to be one of three people in a full uniform. That's this uniform. I was like, Oh God. So I run out, <laughs> run back out to the field and ensemble and everyone's laughing like, Oh my God. <laughs> and I, I just gave everyone the, the look like just shut up. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I was one of the first people like in the full ensemble to put the full uniform on so, you know, they could get or those guys could get like a picture of what it looked like. Um, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that we won that year, I think the torment would have been a lot worse. <laughs> but like, yeah, I, I, I think it was so weird. <laughs> That's what made it so good. It, it right? was kind of, it, it kind of makes initiated... Sense. Yeah, no, 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 I'm following you. I think that it kind of initiated a lot of trends that go on today. I mean, Crown in 2010, or 2010, we started, like, kind of messing with the uniform where we had the the vest with the sleeves. And then through 2010, 11, 12, like, they would change the sleeve colors. Mm -hmm. But then 13, they're like, all right, here we go. And then they went full purple band pants mode yeah <laughs> and like it was like a hashtag and like blah 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 but i mean the core was so killer that nobody cared yeah yeah i'd, I'd say well, crown prop crown definitely bridged the gap between wgi and dci like they were like that middle ground they were the first ones to try to get more creative and non-traditional with the uniforms and then i think blue coats fully took it over the edge in 2016 and now obviously haven't looked back yet I'm still no, waiting yeah, for it's... someone to come out one year in like a traditional uniform, just as like a throwback type type feel thing. Well, even punch, if it, punch even... people still do it, like open class and some yeah, of the, like but, non. I mean, not I as know. not as I don't know. I don't know. But, I know. I'm following I, you though, Mike. I it definitely... ain't gonna happen this summer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Jeez. Uh, too soon. R.I.P. Too soon. Uh, it happened. It Gosh. happened. Um. So, well, am I going crazy? For some reason, I thought because. Tom taught at Crown as the caption head at some point, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, so I, yeah, aged out 15, in That's 13. The, okay. He, he I was there remember in 15, if it was, yeah, in 16. Okay. It was, I've been out of the game a lot longer than I thought. Like I aged out a long time ago. <laughs> like 12 and 13 don't feel that long ago to me right now, despite it being eight years ago. Um, yeah. But 
I, yeah, I'm I was with like, you. <laughs> wasn't, who was the caption head in 12 and 13? Hannum 12 and 13 there. was Hannum. Or no, yeah, Hannum. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. He was like the full-on caption. Because Bricky was teaching yeah. at Crown in 12 and 13, right? As like the battery coordinator. He was there in 12. 12. In 12, yeah. 7 okay. is heaven. Yeah. That's right. Thank you for sending me that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Even though uh, it is on tab space, so if you want to go buy it on tab space, give Josh Bricky <laughs> your well-deserved dollars. I should have done that. Well, <laughs> sorry, Josh. You uh, you actually did have the music at one point for free, so yeah, it's now true. in my mom's basement somewhere. <laughs> you didn't bring your your like memorabilia out to California with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Good sure question. the square footage in California is a little bit smaller than the square footage in Massachusetts. That's true. I don't <laughs> know. The square footage in Massachusetts is probably pretty high. Yeah. It, well, and Massachusetts, you have like a basement too. There's no uh, basements. I mean, I live in an apartment, not like I have a basement right now. But hmm. yeah, be it the small square footage or uh, my wife's telling me no. Um, <laughs> 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 I definitely still have some memorabilia. I have like some drum heads like we all do and – um actually i brought my rings into the office uh so I, I put those up on my desk so people could see those hell yeah i don't blame yeah. you on Flex that on one. Them. so before we right. move on past your marching career to your teaching experience and then what you do for a job now um i have to say 2011 cadets is probably one of my favorite modern day drum corps shows and it's it's funny to hear you say like that summer was rough <laughs> but yeah. that show was just it's so much fun to watch it's so well designed it's so yeah. effective the playing's great um the uniforms cl- like the dark and light thing worked d- so well done i mean did yeah. you, obviously you won a gold medal so you all knew it was good but it's just so funny for me to hear somebody that was in it talk about i was like man that was a rough summer that was brutal. <laughs> i know i i didn't yeah i mean it was just, I think there were so many things that happened that summer, right? That were in the favor or played out to be in the favor of the core. For one, we went to the West coast that year. So we got to see the blue devils a lot sooner in the summer than we would have any other neural tour. So I think having put on a lot of miles on the bus and a lot of weird rehearsal days early on, it was tough to find our groove. Um, I think the first couple competitions, we were just enamored with being in California um, I think we ended up, we did compete pretty well. I can't remember exactly some of the scores. I think we were probably neck and neck with devs throughout that whole swing of the tour. Um, but yeah, just from like uh, inside perspective, I guess it was, it was, like I said, it was just a rough summer. I mean, they, we, we were beat, we worked differently. Um, there was a dude, Jared Braley or Brink, Brink, I can't remember his name, but he, he came on board as a visual guy um, from Blue Devils. So he had a new, different mindset for the core. And, uh, y- you know, I-, I think that paired with so many other things, it just, it was, a, again, it was just a perfect storm. It was a great show. It was so well designed. I think from spring training, when we first saw the uniforms, um, we knew it was definitely going to be different and special. Um, even the beats, like just playing the some of Colin's music at spring training and in some of the camps, I think we were getting we we just had a hype behind it, as any student in DCI does at any or any kid in some line in drum corps. You know, you're obviously going to hype your beats, but like some of the stuff he was coming out with was just like, all right, this is like proving ground, right? Like this is sick. And there's a thing I don't know if you guys know this, but every odd year at the cadets is like a really good year. So if you go back all the way to like 2000, like some of those guys will tell you, you know, it's just, it's always worked out. Like Oh five was a great year. Oh three was a great year. Oh four kind of fell off. Oh six weird year. Oh seven great year. Right. Oh eight weird. Oh nine. It was like a history. West side story. West side story. You know what I mean? 10, my first year. Eh, was that the so Toy great. Soldier show? Yeah, yeah, Toy Soldier show. But 11, 11 one, great year. 12, don't remember the show. 13, Medea won a drum trophy. Won a drum trophy. 
Yeah. So it's it's the odd year thing for the cadets. So I think we kind of had that mystique and that kind of like vibe behind us going into it. So we were hyped about it. <laughs> um, and then it ended up like being true to history, I guess. So there's that, that stuff was really cool though. The the nuance in between like the sectional writing between like the angels and demons, even of the battery, like the like more aggressive style of the demons and like the more fluid yeah. style of the I mean, I mean there's a lot of nuance in that show that you have to watch it a couple times to really pick up on you like, oh that's pretty sweet <laughs> yeah it was uh it was the first time i had ever seen davisi written on a chart <laughs> Be- so <laughs> because because of the whole angels and demons theme uh theme right there was a lot of davisi writing where you know it was like the demons and and kind of trying to navigate it through the through the um camp season or whatever you want to call it through the auditions it was it was a little weird so it was like all right a b a b right like you guys are gonna play this you guys play this and we didn't really know the show yet so we didn't really get it and then once we got like angels and demons oh half of us are gonna be this half of us gonna be that makes sense right so like you're saying with the nuances i think i think there's a lot of cool stuff that came came through um came through for that show especially in Colin's writing for sure and for people who like maybe like what's the VC writing it's like when you put the same section and like the same line uh but like it's very it's more common in like i would say wind ensemble literature where like clarinet one clarinet two clarinet three are like all written on the same line but you have to figure out like yeah it takes you a second to look at it like all right whose part's whose yeah um, I just had to confirm that with my wife because I was like, I think I remember what this is, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I so, should have been more clear, but yeah. So there was a lot of. Well, stuff no, I, I had to think about. I was like, wait, what is the VC? Like, oh, that's where like tenor one and two are playing the same this thing, but tenor three and four are playing this different playing part, different, but it's written right. on like the same <laughs> staff so, or whatever. Yeah, 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 written on the same staff. Yeah. Well, I just but, I just learned something new because I'm sitting here. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I was like, well, hopefully one of them will ask or clarify, but I'll just ignore I mean, it if yeah. they don't. My wife, being a band director, came in clutch there for a second. Yeah. So, all right, thank uh, you, Andre. So, <laughs> to bring this thing home, we've been going. We've crossed the hour mark by a few minutes. We try to keep them between an hour to an hour and twenty. Dude, max, everybody's on Corona. They don't have anything else to do. They'll listen. I to know, I know, hours. but right. So, next thing I want to do is we'll stay on drum corps and indoor for a second, but I want to ask. Because obviously you did Rhythm X in 2012 with Hell myself yeah, we did. and with Evan. Do you remember early season, all the crazy ideas they were selling us about that show and how awesome it was going to be? <laughs> yeah. Like and then we're, how we're gonna have none, like of it, none of it panned out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, like the no, music, well, when, when in, they designed words, the show, like yeah. it started from the very beginning of like, they told us and let us listen to like Josh Bricky sent Evan a sound clip of Palladia, I think, was going to be the opener of the show originally. Well, and... I thought it was Eric Whitaker. Uh... It was Eric Whitaker. <laughs> no, this was before it wasn't. Sorry, that was way before. Either way, all the stuff uh... they wanted to do and music they wanted to play, they ended up like I not getting. I don't even remember. They wanted to use like it. all of the lights, that pop song from. Um... Whose song was that? Was that Kanye? Kanye? Oh, yeah, 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 that song. They wanted to use that. They wanted to use like some pop songs and stuff. Yeah, and they got none of it. They had to like audible at the last minute on so much stuff and like the logistics of all kinds of crazy like light type stuff. How that season was that throwback? Subs at stubs. Oh, that whole season was like a. All right, we're just gonna punt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff that happened that year. Uh, I think a lot them. of that show this was a scramble cuz like rehearsal space uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. It was wild. Um, that was my introduction into WGI Independent. I'm surprised you did it a second year. <laughs> yeah. You're not the only one there who said that, but yeah, I, uh, I kind of am too. I I I could have marched 13 and 14. Yeah. And I could have yeah, I could have marched 14, I think. I had the I had the bonus winner. So I aged out a drum corps in 12, and then I could have marched 13 as what most people's age out would have been 13. But because my birthday is WGI finals week, um, I would have gotten an extra winner. And it's just – it wasn't because of the experience in 12 that I didn't go back. I mean, it contributed a little bit because, like, just – 
I don't know. Yeah. The people that I rode with weren't they had aged out or weren't doing it, and I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come back up there because I don't. And then of course I told Evan too when I decided I wasn't gonna do it that they're gonna win this year. Just watch. <laughs> they're gonna win a gold medal. And then I saw like a video from rehearsal from January on like the alumni page or whatever, and I was like, Yep, <laughs> this is awesome. Of course, I knew it. Yeah, but the only well, time I, I felt the same way, I felt the same way in fourteen too. Like, cause I aged myself out after thirteen, after after we won in thirteen, I was like, yeah, I can't. Cause I, I mean, for you and I both, like, we weren't living in Ohio, so it was a little more difficult getting mm-hmm. out there, all that stuff. I was like, yeah, I'm done. I can't come back. Like, I, I got to focus back on school. I remember seeing them in fourteen, like the beats they were playing, and even that whole show, like the um, the Razor's like, Edge. Yeah, the Razor's yeah. Edge. That whole concept, like. I fell in love with that, that the main piece of that show is escaping me, but it was from, um, the dude that tightrope walked across the uh, Twin Towers. Philippe Petit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, yep. I fell in love with that song like two years before they even did that show. So for me, it was like a dagger. I was like, damn, like I really <laughs> wish I could have done that. Cause I love that piece. I love the beats and all that stuff, but it is what it is. I mean, we all, yeah you know either age out or you know got to move on to other things so mm-hmm. life happens life speaking happens. of life you're currently living life that involves both your professional setting and your passion setting working yeah. you touched on this a little bit earlier bond uh working for yamaha so you're living in california yeah what is your what's your title at yamaha I'm the percussion product specialist um well I should say percussion and drum product specialist so uh, my title or my position is within the marketing department um, at Yamaha, and I am the product specialist for marching, concert, and student percussion, as well as uh, acoustic and electronic drum sets. Nice. So, yeah. That so you can hook me up with electronic like, drum set. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Let me know what you want. <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been thinking about buying one and starting to learn. There you go. Let's do it, man. I might actually I, yeah, reach we, out sometime soon. Yeah, for sure. I just bought a house, so, so I have somewhere to put Did it. Did you really? Yeah, I just bought a house. Dang. Congratulations. That's yeah, sick. Yeah, supposed to uh supposed to close, I think not this not this Friday, but probably next Friday. And then Wow, dude, congratulations. And, yeah. and then Thank as you. soon as all this coronavirus stuff is over, we're going to throw a housewarming party and piss off all Mike's neighbors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because I'm having my contractor or my family's contractor do some work to it and I'm putting like a back <laughs> patio on and it's going to be like a fire pit and a grill and it's it's sweet. Oh, outside. Dude, hell oh, yeah. Better. Here I'm we hyped. go. I'm yeah. Hyped. Dude, hell yeah. That sounds sick. Well, it sounds like a house that needs a drum set, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so with your gig at Yamaha, you get to do Quite a bit of traveling, I'm assuming, obviously, with the marching side, dealing with uh, supplying the marching in Mm -hmm. DCI, WGI groups, and then also, I guess, just educationally with a lot of the that go on, the NAMs, the PASICs, the Midwests, and all that gig. Um, What's what's all that like? Just kind of crazy? Yeah, yeah, it is a very busy schedule uh, through the year. Uh, the good thing is that it's cyclical, so it's the same thing every single year, with the uh, the you know the staples sort of being the NAM show um, out here in Anaheim at the beginning of the year, and then going through the DCI season. Um, but I guess to take a step back, um, my my role at Yamaha, um, being it in the marketing department, um, I. I I'm involved in every single touch point for all of those products that I talked about earlier. So for marching, concert, and student percussion, um, and also for drum sets, electronic and acoustic. Any touch point that we have with the market, I'm I am involved with, which you know lends itself to being very busy. <laughs> so we uh, sponsor as a company um, DCI, so we are involved with. Um, several drum cores. So I, you know, I'm traveling through the summer to be with those cores and check, you know, various other things through the year, through the, through the season. Um, cause our normal business also doesn't stop. And then there are the music educator shows. So there are these local, um, MEA kind of events that I'm involved with because our product is there and it's in front of educators and it's important to be involved with those. 
Um, and then there's other trade shows um, like the PASICs that we talked about earlier, like the NAM show um, that we send in product to to showcase. Um, and also we, we supply a lot of backline too for, for programs that will come and kind of use the product. So I'm involved with a, a lot of different things kind of around the product. Um, and then, you know, WGI, which um, – isn't happening obviously this year, which stinks, but yeah, so we, we would send in normally some product for a, a booth space and then generally just to kind of be there to support the organizations and the schools that are, you know, using our product. And there's a lot of artists. There's a whole other side of the business that is artist relations. And um, although it's not my main role, I am a huge window into the company for a lot of our artists and for educators too. So um, kind of like a direct contact for a lot of people um, into the company. So yeah, kind of crazy, kind of busy, but um, like I said, it's, it's cyclical. So I can kind of build my schedule around anticipating a lot of that stuff at least, which is, which is helpful. I'm sure that's also helpful for Lacey. Cause you'd be like, all right, this, this <laughs> happens at the same time every year. Yeah. So if we want a vacation, it's not going to happen during DCI finals week or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And she is a huge, um, my wife, Lacey, uh, she's a huge uh, proponent of our schedule. We have a big family schedule on the wall here, and it's, you know, let's plan things out a month in advance. And she's like, all right, yeah, she's she's the one that's actually pushing me to do that. So she's she's definitely <laughs> loving the fact that things are, you know, April's WGI, DCI for the summer, and then, you know, you kind of, like, expect things to happen. Um, so, yeah, it's, it for works sure, out well sure. that way. Yeah. And with your travel, which is kind of fun, but most of us in, who have done drum corps participated have friends that are located all across the country. Yeah. Um, I don't get to see those friends very often unless I'm either traveling or they're traveling. Um, and so it's fun when you get to go out from California to Dayton for WGI mm -hmm. or Indianapolis for DCI or like when I saw you in Chicago for Midwest <laughs> and like, yep. like – they're texting Paul, are you in Chicago? Yeah. And he's like, yes, I am, actually. I'm like, all right, sweet. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. No, Let's dude, that's up. that's the best part, I think. One of the best parts of my job is, you know, it's, it is a lot of travel. There's a lot of, um, you know, we, we have a large network of dealers that uh, we support. And it, we have um, a whole staff of sales folks that, or with those dealers, excuse me, every single day, uh, you know, almost every day in their territory. So it's sort of rare for me to kind of get those opportunities. So when there is a show um, in, in Chicago or in Indy, wherever it is that I, I'm there for a marketing reason, I always try to tie it in and, and try to go see those dealers and support our sales staff as well. Um, but it's one of my favorite parts of the job is is getting to travel and kind of catch up with some friends that you know i did jump core with and and i'm in there i'm in their area so you know why not why not see them why not hang out and it's cool you know i know for you evan you know without you being a band director it's like yeah you, you go to the midwest thing but you know it's a huge melting pot of you know other band directors and people that we march with so it's it ends up being a cool thing for sure or when you're like hey I'm driving through Lexington because James Campbell is a Yamaha artist. And right, right. We got to catch up with him. And I'm like, I live 20 <laughs> miles from there. Here we go. Yeah, dude, that was perfect. I, I I'm still kicking myself for that trip, um, for for leaving at night because I really wanted to go to Woodford. <laughs> dude, yeah. So Paul's in town. He's yeah. visiting. Uh, like he had mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, he's going through some of the Yamaha schools in the area. UT. Uh, UK, University of Kentucky, then up in Indianapolis. But he had some downtime, so we caught up and we did a bourbon tour in Lexington. There's a bourbon distillery there, Alltech, and they make Town Branch. And we did one in like 15 minutes in. He's like, I should have scheduled more time. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, man, because there's about 30 distilleries like all around here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, still, I remember I'm your, still kicking myself. I remember your face. We're doing that. Uh, we're doing that first tour, and there's like a video, and it's like, oh, 75% of the world's bourbon is made within like 50 miles of where you're standing. You just looked at me like, <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. It's definitely an eye-opening fact if you don't realize how much of the world's <laughs> bourbon is made in Kentucky. 
<laughs> well, that in the limestone too. It's like the whole yeah. state, you know, is just on the a geography limestone. behind it. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Dude, I could nerd. I could nerd science. out for a little while, but <laughs> it's all science, dude. Yeah, you'll have uh, to come back and make a day and make like not a day of it, but like a weekend of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I want to so I'm bad. In. And like, like I was. Well, saying, it's like a double edged yeah. sword. Where's your wife from? Uh, so she's from she's from Dartmouth too. She's from Massachusetts, dude. So it's like a double edged thing, like. My wife and I need to make our way out west, and you guys yep. just need to come get into Kentucky and hang out. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's set it up, dude. After all this Rona, it's, yeah, it's, for real, dude. It's so funny how <laughs> many people we've had on this podcast that we've inadvertently said, "Hey, you should come to Kentucky, and we'll drink, we'll take you to the bourbon distilleries." Like uh, Richard Ramos. <laughs> we yeah. Uh, who else? There's been a bunch of people on here. Oh, dude. Yeah, basically everybody I talked to, I was like, dude, yeah, we can come out. We have great hiking. We have lots of bourbon and yep. like horse betting. So <laughs> they're like, all right, sounds good. Deal. Horse betting. Oh, another small tangent here. So obviously you're from the New England New England area. Uh, big news lately. Tom Brady. Are you are are you a Patriots fan? Buccaneers. Yeah. So I am. <laughs> I wouldn't even say like a fair weather. Fan fan i'm like you know like all of us have just been so like wrapped up with music and band i <laughs> i don't keep up with like the trades and and all the nitty-gritty i mean i'll definitely watch them when they're on but i'm not like a, i'm not like a power fan i hate to admit it <laughs> that's all right that's kind of how i am i feel like i feel like more people will respect you than me like oh, it's typical new england uh, or whatever the accent is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice try <laughs> that was it you did it <laughs> boston <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, the, the Tom Brady Celtics Boston area. Zach Slicker might disown you over that one, but that's all right. Yeah, um, yeah. Over it. Out out there in the lot, ripping his Celtics Garnet jersey. <laughs> I love it. I'm like, so that's my that's basketball is my really my sport. I mean, Celtics yeah. is is my team for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tom Brady going to the Buccaneers. I think it's just silly. Like he's gonna end up doing the Paul Pierce thing, coming back and retiring his jersey as a Patriot. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't understand sure. why he did it. I said forever, like just he's retire, just gonna play bro. one more year at the at, at the Patriots and then retire. Like just they're gonna build a statue. They're gonna build you a statue of you outside their stadium. Like it's like yeah, or, MJ going to the Wizards. It's like, dude, why? Yeah. Or you know, it, you know who it's like is like Peyton Manning, right? Going to Denver and then well, they build they a statue a for him outside of Indy. Though. The That's Manning true. thing I think is different. Because he left not be he left for surgery and he came back and the Colts didn't want to he wanted to go to the Colts I think didn't he and and they didn't want to take a chance on him because they thought like he's not going to be able to do it because of the surgery and come back from it and so he was like fine and the Broncos needed a quarterback and so he went there obviously and the rest is history but I yeah. think like and then won a championship I yeah. don't think the Buccaneers are going to win a championship no no, no. yeah no are the no, Buccaneers sure. really like I don't think the Patriots are going to be great but are the Buccaneers really going to be that much better i don't know dude that, if i were the buccaneers i'd go all in I'm like all right antonio brown publicity nightmare can he catch footballs yep all right bring him let's go <laughs> yeah <laughs> dude they should honestly he's chilling in, in south florida too yeah dude like all right we'll just put all our eggs in one basket for one year whatever yep. we'll ride it yeah yep. they definitely should do that <laughs> all right Dang, guys babe. I think we hit everything on the list. I think we've uh, covered all the bases here. Are you a Red Sox fan? Got to ask that. Uh, for as much as a Patriot fan okay. I am, I guess right, I am fair, a Red Sox fair. fan. You said basketball is your sport. All right. But <laughs> let's close this out. Evan, you got anything else? I'm good, man. All right. Paul, anything else? Um, no, you guys want to play loose? <laughs> <laughs> no oh, i don't remember it Please. i remember the first like four or five bars like i've yeah, tried to play like... it recently because i've been drumming a lot more stuck in my house and yeah, I, I don't remember much head, of it but the muscle memory would probably fail me yeah i i could pick it back up if i put the sheet music in front of me and give me like 20 minutes i could probably I, get it back i, I think but... i'm the same i think i'm the same way i think i would be the same thing i can't just, play it right now it's just been so long all right well that's a whole <laughs> different thing so uh Thanks, everybody, for uh, hanging out today. As always, uh, I'll reiterate from, like I said in the beginning, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever your venue of choice to listen is. 
Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram for updates about the podcast. And then hit us up on patreon.com slash aged out podcast if you want to give any kind of financial support. And with that out of the way, thanks again, Paul. It was great having you on. We'll be in touch. We'll see everybody next time. Peace. Peace. Thank you so much, guys.